call to order this Monday, March 13th meeting of the Montpelier Planning Commission. First, we have to approve the agenda, and I'll take a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Okay, motion by John. We have a second. You can do it. I'll second. Second from Brian. Okay. Uh, those in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. 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 Okay. Agenda approved. Um, <clears throat> comments from the chair. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so, Zach Watson, who's um, putting together the project on Northfield Street for Habitat for Humanity, had reached out to Gabe and I this past week. Um, talking about his interest in doing a neighborhood development area, apparently to get funding. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to explain in a second to get funding though. This is the thing that really stands out about these things. Um, developers sometimes need, especially like, like a habitat type project where they're looking for grants, about they need to be in some kind of development area type thing to, to qualify or, or just really helps their applications. So, um, what these are is like, uh, John just told me these existed for a few years. Uh, before that I was under the impression it had been around shorter than that, but, um, the, a city or a developer can apply to have an area outside of a growth center, um, be called a neighborhood development area. And the, and this is through the state and the benefits of that are, cheaper act to um act 250 applications um i think some exemptions to land gains tax uh just like general stuff that the, the state offers for for saving money but for a really big project that's that's in the like multi-millions these fees can be in the millions and so like these these neighborhood development areas can actually save a ton of money. And like I said before, they can help people get access to funding. Um, Montpelier does not have one. Um, I, I, I'm i going to read Mike's mind and say that uh, we were probably going to cover this when we got to the chapter on the land use plan or, or on, on land use for our city plan. Um, but um, the reason I'm bringing it up is since an application process takes a while, we might want to get the ball rolling on an application process for identifying some neighborhood development areas and maybe, um, and, and, you know, a lot of the technical sides, you know, Mike, you tell us like how you want to handle it. I'm assuming that one of the first things we'll have to do is like as a city identify where we would like to put them. Um, one place would be around the development that Habitat's proposing, Habitat Humanity's proposing around Northfield Street. That's a walkable place. We changed the zoning so that so that um, development could happen there. Um, and, but there's probably going to be a couple other places, I would think, too. Um, so, yeah, so I, I thought I'd bring that up, and then I'll... Um, hand it over to everybody else, Mike and everyone. Um, yeah, I think John just sent us a link. You can, you can easily pull up some background info on these things. Another, another thing I was going to ask everybody is, should we have someone come in and talk about, about this? Um, my understanding is, uh, Josh that works with you, Mike has some background on this. Um, so yeah, maybe there could be a person. But. He's done one. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's not complicated. I, what I looked at, the reason why I looked at it this, uh, last week was because I wanted to make sure that because we were assembling a new revision to our, you know, another zoning amendment. So we've, We'll talk about it later in the meeting, but I looked it up because I wanted to make sure that we identified any little details. If there was something that was going to be required in an application for an NDA, if we needed that in the zoning, we should make sure as we're working on the zoning that we've got that ready to go. Um, so okay. 
so I was just trying to look ahead for that piece. And what I realized is we're pretty, we, we've got all the pieces we need to get approved for a, a number of these areas. The issue that comes up is um, really what we want to apply it to. Um, because as John mentioned, it is, uh, it does apply to the growth center. And that is one of the districts we want to amend with country club roads. So Saban's pasture is in our growth center, but the country club is not, we would not be able to put the country club road parcel into the NDA. There are two, two ways of having an NDA. One is within a half a mile of the existing designated downtown. And the other one is it's got to be part of a growth center. And it can be both. Our property out there is too far away to get the, from the designated downtown to be included in option A. So it would have to be part of option B. And we if, if we want to use any of those NDA special rules, maybe it doesn't make a difference for the country club road property. But if it does, then we'll probably have to do the NDA after we've amended our growth center boundary. But um, do we know, do we know if for, like, let's say we do three NDAs, one of them involves the country club. Would that be all in the same application or we do multiple applications? I think we'd probably want to try to do it with, with one. We could do it with more than one. I'd, I'd have to talk to somebody at the state probably to go through and find out what they would recommend. I haven't talked to anyone at the RPC and I haven't talked to anyone at the state specifically about what might be the, you know, the recommended path. I would think it'd probably be under one application, but maybe they maybe they'll tell me it doesn't matter i do i do think there's language in it that does allow you to extend it beyond the the half mile if it's consistent with the goals of um 4302 and that there are you know natural constraints limiting development around and it's a logical extension of you know our our settlement pattern um and that it's adjacent to existing development so may or may not be enough there for us to justify wait for the country club um yeah okay so what you're saying is extending the growth center first is probably the best option for that yeah, and we'll have to see. Um, so we're waiting. The Country Club Road master plan process is going on right now, and they're hoping to get a decision in April. So my plan all along for doing an NDA application was to be looking this summer to putting together an application because then, you know, depending on the results, if if the council and the public decides not to have a lot of housing, at Country Club Road for whatever reason, then it wouldn't make sense to make it an NDA and we don't have to worry about the growth center and we can just move forward. Um, my expectation is it's probably going to have a lot and we're, but ne and then the question is, is there value to it? Um, I would think there is, even though it's a city owned property, it is, um, we aren't doing the development. So we're going to be selling those lots. So the housing that gets developed isn't going to be developed by the city of Montpelier. It's going to be developed by either for-profit housing in some cases. It may be non-profit housing in some cases, but it's going to be properties that we're going to be selling those parcels off. And those Act 250 exemptions and cost savings would probably be something that those entities would be you know, appreciative of us getting that done. So my sense is, the timing of this is going to probably be get get the master plan done, um, do a growth center amendment, and then move into a uh, NDA application, which I don't think will take long. I think they're fairly quick applications once you've got all of your pieces together. Um, so that would okay. be my sense on the on the timing of that. And I know that doesn't entirely work with Zach's schedule, but. Um, my understanding is that that they're they're not going to get that project going until next year. So maybe if if we if we do get our things done without 
too much delay that maybe it would work for for habitat um like if they if if they need it if they need us to have it done by next year if we you know that seems possible that we maybe we get our application in the fall does that sound reasonable to you mike like yeah, that would be my expectation. I mean, I, I think, especially with Country Club Road, we're trying to, you know, we want to be, um, you know, trying to break ground by next spring. So if we're going to be doing that, we've got to get, um, as I mentioned in the past, we, you know, I break things into three pieces. we got planning, preparation, and then implementation. Plan, prepare, implement. And um, we're in the planning part, and we're going to very quickly – at the end of um, hopefully, you know, May sometime in May that the council will make a final decision. May, June, we'll have a final decision on what the plan is. What are we going to do? And then we're going to move into the preparation pieces, which is going to be all of these. Are we doing TIF is project TIF an option? We'd love to see project TIF or a new TIF district, an option, the growth center, NDAs, zoning changes, because that's all zoned rural. We're going to have to rezone that. And we're going to, you know, the zoning changes I'll be talking about later are really we'll have a conversation. And then when we have the information from the master plan, we're going to add that on. Um, we're not going to have our public hearing on the zoning amendment until we've got those country club road changes. And then, you know, again, that's another set of things. And then do we need act 250 permits? Do we need local permits? That's all in the pre preparation piece. So hopefully by next spring, We've got everything lined up. Um, we're ready for any bond votes that we may need next town meeting day. So in 2024, we can move into construction and that's our, that's our plan. So yeah, if, if he's waiting till next year, he'll be, he'll, you know, we should have all of those changes done because it's going to be front loaded with the country club road project. Okay. Yeah. That's, that sounds great. That sounds really great. Um, I think staying on schedule, obviously, is the, the key there. Uh, do you need anything from us about the NDAs? Like, do you think that it would make sense for the Planning Commission to take a stab at having some recommenda recommendations for City Council on some areas to target with that? Or, um, I don't know. Uh, I, I think when we do the, when we, the, and you mentioned it, uh, a couple minutes ago, the the land use plan for the city plan. Th this is where these conversations come right up, and we should have the conversations of, you know, what designations make sense in what area based on what our goals are. Um, sure. So, the the NDA is really about developing new neighborhoods, even though they call it neighborhood. You know, it it tends to have rules that could really overlay over existing neighborhoods. For the most part, it's about new neighborhoods. So. These areas like Northfield Street, like Country Club Road, like Saban's Pasture, like Crestview, which is over by Terrace Street, these are mm -hmm. all very logical places that I would expect to have a an NDA um, overlay. Okay, that sounds good. Then that's we'll put our two cents in when it comes to the energy plan, um, and and get the ball rolling, like you said. Um, okay, does anybody else have any more questions about the NDA issue? It's an unfortunate I acronym. Go ahead, Maria. Question about the, um, because I was looking at the website that somebody sent us, um, and the whole idea is to promote growth in, within like a walkable distance of the downtown, and it seems like the country club, I mean, especially if you're talking about like not eagle, eagles flying distance, like actual getting to and from the downtown, it's actually quite far. I mean, it might be like three miles right to get from downtown Montpelier on a road up to the country club. So, yeah, and it, it is part of, so that's one piece of it. The other one is the growth centers areas that you expect to have um, a lot of growth. So I think this, it, it'll make more sense if the development, and we'll see where the master plan goes. If the master plan talks about a lot of housing, then we're going to need a second access and this is going to lead to a discussion of, you know, building and taking an official map and making an official map to show roads that are going to go all the way through Sabin's pasture and back down okay. or, and, or all the way across to um, VCFA. So there's a, a space where the parking is that we could connect a road 
across to. We would have to go through a planning process and right. have, a, have a process to build a road through. And then Country Club Road is not as far away as as it is now because now you've got to go all the way down to River Street right, and all exactly. the way up to the roundabout. So it gets a little um, bit shorter. But even still, I mean, if there's a road through Sabin's Pasture to the Country Club, like what is that distance? It seems like it's still over a mile from the downtown. It would probably be a mile, but it would be within the growth center. So, um, and if you were to add the amount of development that is potential in, um, so we've got in, in Montpelier right now in the entire city, we have about 4,000 housing units. It's been estimated we could put a thousand housing units between, you know, Sabin's Pasture and uh, Country Club Road. It could be, you know, anywhere from a couple hundred up to a thousand at, at, the, at the most. So it really is a major extension of the downtown and the community if we were to build out, um, you know, a couple hundred units on the lower Sabin's Pasture and then, uh, you know, a couple hundred more out um, at the other end at the Country Club Road and then a certain number of units that are going to be spread in between, you know, between those. 300 acres or 200 acres that are out there, you know, there's going to be a lot of conserved lands, a lot of other lands out there, but there'll, there'll be some housing potential, but that's up to what city council and the public come up with. It, it isn't direct. And we'll see what the, the downtown board says we're going to be applying. If the downtown board says, no, it's not proximate to, and it's not a continuation of our downtown, then, right. then we move forward we go through and say, okay, that, that would have been a benefit and would have made our project easier and would have made it more likely that we could make affordable housing. It just means we're going to build housing that the owners of those housing units are going to be having to absorb the costs of those developments. And that's, you know, that's just costs that get passed along to the buyer and it may make projects more unaffordable. Right. I mean, what do what other people think to me the I think the beautiful thing about Montpelier is its centralized business district. You know, if we're, we're talking about expanding the city by a 25%. And we don't expect that over the short term. That's a long term. That could oh, take 15, like, 20 years to add that many units. to a decentralized city, you know, having that many units so far from the city core. But what do other people think? I I'm just curious what everyone's kind of viewpoint is on that. Like all housing is good. I think smart growth is also good. I think we, we already have some housing development that's, that's like that. Um, up Bailey street and then the neighborhoods are out that way. Um, I think those were built in the sixties or seventies when sprawl was happening. Um, and that's a big chunk of our housing already, which is not exactly walkable, but still, you know, in the city and it's a neighborhood. There's other ones across the river that are kind of like that. Um, I see what you're saying. Yeah, it's not something I probably would have planned for. But I think as Mike was saying, too, there's no guarantee that they're actually going to take the housing route with the country club, that maybe that they'll, it'll be other amenities for the city. It looks like it's looks like it's maybe a mile from the the co-op, like a three quarters of a mile from the um, from um, the edge of our our growth center. I mean, there is no, there's probably no perfect place to put housing in Montpelier. I I, I don't know. I feel like if there's a housing crunch. We need more housing, or I think that's what everyone wants. We want that's part of our plan is to have affordable housing. It, have housing, have it be affordable. I mean, I'm not saying put it anywhere, but there's only a few places we could put new housing. From what I'm learning from you guys, from this from this board, this commission. So, um, I mean, I'm I don't know. I'm 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 not saying we build it no matter what. I'm just saying like, I'd be willing to put it a little farther out if it's more units. 
Yeah, I mean, to me, it's better to put housing at the Elks Club than to put more housing in Callis or East Montpelier or, Bear, you know, like all the people who come to Montpelier for services. So I think of it that way. Yeah, as someone who lives a mile from downtown and can live without a car, no problem, I feel like my attitude has changed from when I lived in cities and considered like a quarter mile, you know, was the gold standard and, and, uh, and yeah, maybe people can walk half a mile, but, uh, they look a mile's not, not a huge deal. I think, um, AOT is, is going to be, I think releasing a study fairly soon looking at mode and, and vehicle trips across Vermont using some interesting mobility data and the, I think the, the like median walking trip for people traveling to work is about a mile in the state. Um, so it doesn't seem all the places where we can put housing, it seems like it seems reasonable. I might not have always, wouldn't have always thought that, especially I guess the question mark being like, you know, Saban's pasture. If it was like a, a logical extension of like a some gridded neighborhoods that you had some some nice like walkable ways to get into town, that would be. It seems like that would be a no brainer, but you do have this this large undeveloped piece. So yeah, I don't know. Just thinking out loud here. Well, uh, yeah, this is, this is all interesting. And, um, I guess the country club stuff's going to just like be changing and we're going to see, I don't, I don't even know how much wool we're going to have in it. Um, but, uh, we should move on with the agenda. Um, so we do have some stuff we want to get done. Um, the next thing on the agenda was general business. And I think we have a member of the public on Zoom with us. Um, so um, now's the time for anyone to comment on anything that's not on the agenda. Um, and we have a visitor, uh, the name on Zoom is Daniel Costin. Um, so Daniel, if you have anything you'd like to bring up, um, this is your chance. Um, I assume no one's there with you, Mike, in the room. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to uh, check in on what you're doing. I live uh, in the area uh, close by where the Habitat for Humanity property is going to go, and I'm just kind of keeping track of, uh, you know, what the status of that project is. So I, I don't have any other comment, but, but thank you for giving me the opportunity. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're not doing anything directly. I um, mean, you know, we did the, the zoning changes and we were just discussing how um, that area would make sense for a new for a neighborhood development area, which is something that, that we would do through the state to allow development to be cheaper. Um, other than that, we're not doing a lot, but we, you know, I think as the planning commission, we see that area as an opportunity for housing growth because it's like we were just talking about it's a it's a walkable neighborhood to the downtown which is what we're tr what we want to see, where we want to see housing happen um yes and i i would agree and uh, uh yeah the the part that's unclear to some in the neighborhood are is uh you know where the access uh to that property would be uh coming from um, I, I, I don't know yeah, if that's we don't... determined but yeah yeah, that's, we that's we, so I mean, we were told, we were told like how it might happen at the time, but we you know we didn't make that change based on a single project, so we didn't learn a lot about it. Um, Mike, do you even have an application about um, any changes to roads or anything? No, there would there's some conversation going on now. That's why there was supposed to be a public hearing tonight um, that Habitat was hosting. That was why I kept having people coming in that I had to keep checking on. Um, but the meeting got postponed because they're they're addressing a couple issues with the with DPW before they can write their final report. And um, one of them is the uh, the 
steepness of the access road to the site and the second is the intersection with Northfield Street. Um, so those were two areas that needed to get some questions answered from DPW as to whether they were viable options or if they would need to go through and do some additional engineering to, to either move or adjust or come up with different intersection alignments or roads or whatever. So, but we don't have any of those answers. Okay. And that's not been rescheduled for a fixed date uh, nope. as of yet. Nope. Okay. Not yet. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Sure. Sure. Thanks Mike, for coming in. Mike, do we have any idea like where the, Road is going to come in because it doesn't front on Northfield Street, right? Uh, it does front on Northfield Street. Uh, it there's um. It's actually. It's part of a larger. It's 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 a it's a large parcel and it does actually connect down to Northfield Street. But I think the access is coming down. If you know where Dan Jones lives on Northfield Street, it's actually coming down, partly on. Uh, down the side of his property to intersect with Northfield Street. They were gonna they were gonna need to purchase an easement if I understood it correctly to to build an access down the um, using some of Dan Jones land. So it's it's right near the inf was it Derby Drive? It's near the Derby Drive intersection and that's been one of the issues is that it's near it, but it doesn't square with the intersection. And so the question for DPW is, could we approve that if it's not squared? Um, and that's where we, th we think there's an issue that DPW does need to comment on. And they would either have to move up and purchase more of Dan Jones land to square up the intersection to make a four-way intersection, which could then be, if it needed to, it could be managed with a light or whatever. Otherwise, it would have to move farther downhill to maybe square up with something else farther down the hill um, to put enough space between the two intersections that we don't end up with a state street, east state street type alignment that are really difficult in our high hazard locations. So we'll see. We'll see what the outcome is. I haven't been following the details of the Northfield project very specifically, because it's mostly just in a planning step. Um, Josh Jerome in my office has been managing the, the community development funds in that process. Um, so it's still a planning in the planning phase. Thank you. All righty. Um, so moving on to the, the, the big, the big stuff for the tonight. Um, we're going to continue our discussion of the CNU recommendations. Um, there's notes uh, that I encourage folks to pull up on the Google Drive from last time. Uh, a quick recap is that uh, we seem to be in agreement to uh, recommend to remove the density caps um, in the... Um, Design Review District, uh, which was uh, which is a direct response to the number one suggestion from CNU, uh, we decided to not adopt design standards for additional residential unit units. In other words, not amend our design review uh, regulations because they did not seem to uh, need those changes. Because Mike pointed out the, you know, there were some factual misunderstandings um, in that section. And then for their suggestion three, which was to clarify the process for incrementally adding residential units, we came up with our own way to incrementally add new units, which is to, outside the design review district, allow four units on each conforming building lot in the city. So those two big changes would work hand in hand where we're allowing more housing inside and outside the design review district in different ways. Um, and I, and I kept notes for the rationale. I assume that, you know, when we go to suggest this, Mike always does a memo up for city council. Mike, at this point, maybe you could just use our notes to do your thing. Um, 
one question for the planning commission could be that we uh, we could write our own policy. Like Mike normally does like a technical type explanation. We could do a policy one to um, supplement that, which maybe is not a bad idea in this case, since we're expecting there might be some public pushback. So that's kind of where I'm thinking right now. But with that, I'm just going to hand it over. Like, do is there anything more on this? the CNU letter that folks want to get at or any more ideas out there that you want to kick around? I just had a question. Um, somebody just happened to mention to me this weekend that the last one about the four units on any buildable lot, is that part of the housing omnibus bill? So if that passes, that would be state uh standard anyway or am i getting confused about that do you know mike just curious i think it depends on the language of the bill um one is to make up to four units permitted uses which we already do but you wouldn't be able to put in four units unless you have the correct amount of density and I think we had a conversation in ours that maybe you'd be allowed to have four units regardless of what your density is, was one of our conversations. I don't know how it's worded in ours. So it would be slightly different than I think, I think what the state is saying is just turn them into permitted uses. You can't have quadplexes as conditional uses. They would have to be permitted uses but you'd still have to meet the density and the parking requirements. So if you don't have enough parking or you don't have enough density, then you can't do it. Oh, okay. All right. That's helpful. Mike, can you, can you tell us a little bit about the, the parking? So inside that design review district, you know, just going back through the notes, it talks about, you know, if, I mean, we, we've updated some of that and they misread some of it. Right. So there's some confusion about what they're talking about, but the, if we had good design review over parking as an example, right, that that would allow us to, to regulate in a different way. Um, I know that most of the downtown, we've eliminated parking requirements. Does that cover all of that design review district or is there part of that, that there's still parking requirements? There's quite a lot of it that still has parking requirements. Uh, the design review district extends out through most of what would be Western Gateway, goes up through National Life. So National Life is in design review um, and they have parking requirements. Does our design review address um, any standards for, for parking? I mean, it's just the straight standards of yes, whatever goes with the zoning area. Yeah, whatever goes with the the zoning. I mean- Is it, is it possible to, t I mean, I don't know what the appetite is for that or are we just, you know, kicking over like a can of worms to talk about parking. It just seems like if we're going to say, you know, all these other things, right. In terms of lifting density and everything else, that parking would be a key component of that. Yeah. I don't know off the top of my head, how many projects have been limited by the amount of parking. Um, I have, you know, from time to time known of projects that can't go forward because they don't have enough density. I don't know very many projects that get stopped because of parking, at least not parking as a result of the zoning. There may be projects where for, you know, financing reasons, they're, you know, they're kind of limited that the, the, their banks won't loan to them because they don't have enough parking. Um, some big, larger multifamily, um, you know, I'll think about like the transit center. That's why all the parking in the transit center, there are 36 parking spaces, and there are 36 units. Actually, I think there might be 40 parking spaces and 36 units. And that was because their financing required them to have one parking space for every dwelling unit, even though they're literally over a transit center in the downtown. But um, that was the requirement of financing, not the requirement that we at the city imposed on them. I just wonder if it allows people to think more creatively about what we might, we may not have seen it in the future, right? But we're expanding this area. I mean, am I the only one who thinks that this is worth talking about or? Uh, we've actually had these debates um, two, three years ago, I think, um, 
we had some debates. Uh, it was a totally different composition on the planning commission. Um, but I think there was like a majority of us that were in favor of changing the parking requirements, but we had two or three people who were um, not quite sold on it at the time. Uh, so we, I don't think we ended up acting on it. Um, but yeah, we've, you, we've, we've had these debates, Gabe, about, about not having the parking requirements for residential units. Um, and, and we also made some changes some years ago to ease up on it a bit, right, Mike? Like, oh, um, it, for, it, for it eased, eased them up a lot over the, yeah. the, the pre-2018 zoning had, you know, a much more typical set of rules for, for parking. And with the new 2018 rules, when they came in, it drastically cut them down and, and, and allowed a lot of other things like under the old zoning, every individual parking space had to have its own access out. So you couldn't block in any parking. Um, so there's a lot of rules like that. Now we say, you know, you've got to have parking. If you've got a 60 foot driveway, you have three parking spaces. Sure. The front two people can't get out without somebody moving but we still count that as three parking spaces so if you've got a 60 foot driveway and you've got a triplex you're good and how that gets managed is up to the landlord and the people who live there and i'm sure they can sort it out just as i did when i lived in burlington I lived in downtown burlington we piled the cars into the driveway and just stack, stacked them in depending on who had to get up earliest and get out first in the morning um, so, so Gabe, to answer your question, I mean, for me, the only misgiving I would have is that it's not a direct response to the Congress for New Urbanism letter. But as a policy thing that we should do outside of that. Um, well, they, they mention it a few times. They mention it as something that could be regulated by, um, by you know, design review. And I don't, apparently our design review doesn't say anything about parking, so that that won't be applicable. Uh, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just thinking like, again, we think of some of these larger buildings that will be included inside of this, you know, if this were to pass, you know, the city council right now, all of a sudden we've got some buildings that maybe can have, you know, a fourplex or five or whatever, because there's no density requirements, but they can't because they don't have the parking, but they're, you know, on, Bailey or they're, you know, they're like, right. <laughs> they're walking distance to everything. Right. But we're going to tie them all up because uh, they only have a driveway where two cars could be parked. You know, I just, I just wonder about some of that. If we're going to lift this other stuff, doesn't it make sense that it, if we're saying, if the argument is, Hey, we're, we don't, we're not going to follow all of their recommendations because we feel like we like our design review process, but we can, we do feel comfortable that it's good enough to lift density. Does parking come up in that conversation? But Anyway, I'll I'll stop talking about it because it doesn't look like anybody else is that interested. So I think I think there's something there. It makes sense or um especially if we're thinking of it from like a design perspective, like are there things that we can include around um like CNU just doesn't want for us to start paving everyone's front yard to put parking you know, everywhere. And, and I don't think anyone wants that. Right. So yeah, getting rid of, I mean, I've been advocating to get rid of our parking requirements for almost a decade now. I think like our, the number one question I ask anytime we do anything is what, um, like what public good or like, what is the reason we're doing this? What is like the, how is this in the public good? And I don't understand how forcing somebody to create a a space or a home for a large vehicle, which they may or may not have, is in the public interest. We're not, we're we want to be like a net zero community. We're trying to design like walkable downtowns. We've been talking about you know transportation as a service. Transportation like the the future of transportation is going to change. Yet yet we require anyone who wants to build anything to have a home for a car in addition to the home for the person when like we know at least what 10 to 15 percent of households in the city ha don't have a car it's really bizarre um i will get off my my soapbox now and and 
and just say like, yes, I guess I, I am interested. And there probably is maybe uh, a complementary design approach to that could could address some of the CNU comments. I, th I think now that Gabe mentioned the word parking, I searched the document. Parking is mentioned in the doc document kind of indirectly, but there might be enough of a hook there where I could feel honest about saying that a parking change is a response to what CNU is saying. So what do other folks think and what would be a hypothetical parking change? that we would want to do. I, I am all in on this conversation too, Gabe. <laughs> I think you're just doing a good job of saying it. I didn't need a way in. You know, I completely agree that if someone's building a building downtown, requiring them to use part of that to house cars is not creating the kind of community that is attractive or that even is historically accurate with the rest of downtown. Um, yes, I think I, I also agree about the parking requirements. So I'll, I will add, there is one, when we get to the, um, outlining of the zoning changes, this, this came up completely separately. So within our, um, waiver provisions, if you've got a commercial use, you can get a waiver for the, some of your parking requirements if you provide bicycle facilities, but that only extends to commercial development. And so there was a request that said, you know, why shouldn't we, I mean, it's a waiver, you're not automatically getting it, but at least you should be allowed to ask if you provide bicycle facilities, couldn't you get a waiver for residential developments as well? So that's one of the recommendations that's, that is in there just, just to give some additional flexibility to the DRB to be able to go and say, yeah, you don't need all the parking requirements because you're located near transit. You're located near the bike path. You're providing bicycle facilities. You don't need to. You know. I mean, could we do the same thing as that? I know we're talking about a broader uh, application later, but just inside the design review district, could we say you can apply for a waiver, right? If you have adequate, you know, and then it's case by case, right? Oh, you live, you know, a block from the Capitol. Yes, <laughs> you can have a waiver, right? So well, this this proposal would be for any anywhere. And I also wanted to point out, we do have design requirements for parking and for parking lots. It's just not in the design review standards. It's in the parking standards. So you it's can't parking put parking standards. lots in front. You can't put parking in front of the front face of the building. There's a, a number of rules that you do have to meet for parking lots and parking. It's just not into the design review. And the same with this waiver. It would not be in the design review district. Anyone could apply for the waiver. It just may not make sense if somebody's, you know, way out in, you know, out at the end of Terrace Street at the edge of, you know, um, Middlesex, if they wanted to get a waiver for parking, you might be like, okay, I mean, you can apply, but you're going to have a little bit tougher argument because there's no transit out there. There's no bike paths out there. Um, you know, maybe they award it, maybe they don't based on what, what the requirement is, but still there's only one parking space required for each car, for each dwelling unit. Does, does the, the parking like location and stuff, does that only kick in with site plan or conditional use? No, it's, we couched ours under general standards for that reason. So that way parking does apply. Parking standards do apply even for single family homes and duplexes. So it seems like that's like a, a, that in effect is a design standard that applies like across the town, right? Yeah. Yep. And that's what I was trying to say, just not as clearly as you just put it there. It's, it, we do have the design standards that applies to all parking everywhere. Um, it's just not in the design review per se. The DRC won't review it. There are no design review standards through the DRC committee that they would be reviewing. I mean, if we know that we're going to put it through later in the year and there'll be public debate along with all the rest of the changes, do we just hold off on it knowing that we want to see this waiver process, but it's going to be for the whole city? Yeah. I mean, if you're dividing this into two pieces, one being this, the CNU 
AARP recommendations, which I assume whatever you come out with is eventually going to merge with my zoning changes amendment. Um, you know, at some point we're going to bring these together to go through and say, these are the zoning changes we're going to recommend. Some of them came out of CNU AARP. Some of them came out of our process in the, the planning office or whatever else you or the public has mentioned. I think I think I think it might be a good idea though to present the it, it can be all at the same time but I think we should present them separately if you know what I mean just because the city council had asked us to come back with a response to the letter so um just 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 for the sake of clarity and and I think it will help also get those changes through if city council easily sees Oh, these are the things that AARP and CNU wanted us to do. Um, so it seems like we're, the planning commission is not entirely on our own when it comes to to that part. So um, I think it's good to to keep it separated, even even if we're doing it at the same time. Um, do we have a parking fix? Well, okay, uh, uh, okay. Before I ask that, uh, yeah, go ahead, Maria. Um. I mean, I think, so going back to requiring the parking, the parking department team for single family homes, um, I don't understand, <laughs> I guess like I live on East State Street. I'm thinking of Terry Street, which you just brought up. Um, but why, why does a single family home need to have a parking spot? There's on street parking up and down the streets, you know, like. And then on each state street, I purposely park my car on the street because I think it slows cars down. Otherwise, they're going down our street 35 miles per hour. But if my car is on the street, they're slowing down to get around it. <laughs> and so I do it as a safety measure because my kids are playing in my front yard, you know? So I don't understand these requirements to have a parking spot off road, even on Terrace Street. It seems like that's like prime on street parking up there. Um, I don't know. So I don't, I, maybe I just don't understand the purpose of these rules. Nobody the does. Rules are, <laughs> the rules are, this is, I'm, this is not me advocating, but, but the best reasons for the rules I've ever heard were that it makes renters provide parking or else a tenant takes a place and then realizes they've got nowhere to put their car and, depending on where it is, it could be a place where the on-street parking is competitive. And, and so that, that renters feel like they have no, you know, they, they have, the, they have all these parking issues in their lives, which I say that, but then I don't feel like that's super compelling because it's like the perfect thing for the market to take care of. I mean, if, if having a good parking spot's important to you, then you will, should look for that. And I understand that most people aren't, economist brains and thinking about that necessarily when they're looking at apartments. So I, I get that, but still it's like a market thing where if the city's not requiring it, then the landlords that are offering parking, that's a, a you know, worth something perhaps. Um, and the ones that aren't means that that place should maybe not, uh, you know, have the same, va same value. Um, it just seems like the kind of thing that would work itself out through the market. And I think there's this, this misconception, like people want, they're like, well, people should have a place to park their car. And it's like, yeah, there's, that makes some sense, but this doesn't create any additional parking. It just stops new housing from coming in. Like a parking requirement does not make more parking. It just makes it harder to, to build things and, potentially just stops that. So I, I, I completely agree because there's plenty of on street parking on my street at all times, you know? So there is no, I mean, I, I can see like maybe on river street, you know, like these kind of streets that don't have on street parking, but like most of the single family homes, I think there's probably plenty of parking on the street in front of them. And I think we have around a hundred acres of, off street parking as well in our downtown. 
and I mean, the, the one thing I'll point out is, you know, when I got here in 2014, the rules still were, and it wasn't, you know, for a couple of years after that, um, between November 1st and April 15th, there was no on-street parking. So having no, you would have no place to park your car between those months. So that's one of the reasons you'd find a lot of these things. You have to have at least a parking space for one car. You know, if you don't have a car, great. You don't have to plow your driveway, but the chances are good. You're going to have, most people are going to have one car and between these months, there's no on-street parking because of the snow. Then that didn't change till maybe 2016, 17, that they wanted to try to help the renters out. Um, and they went to, they went through a series of different parking options to let people stay, continue to park on street. Um, a little bit like Burlington where you can stay on street till the sign comes up and then you've got to have everybody off so you can remove the snow to most recently we've got the alternate side parking. So that way they can clear snow on the alternate days. Um, but it very much could go back in a couple of years to go right back to, nope, we're going to go back to no, to, to reinstating the parking ban. Um, but that was just, that's probably, you know, that's a reason why you would have these rules is because there is no on-street parking for five months of the year. You know, I guess just circling back to the beginning of the conversation, I, I feel like looking at the notes that you took, Kirby, I think that could be the basis of a memo and knowing that maybe at the same time we're submitting this, that we're also going to have some other changes, right. That will be, uh, that will include a waiver process for, you know, parking requirements. I mean, I feel, I feel pretty good about that. That'd be, I mean, that'd be pretty great if we could get that stuff through. Okay. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm a little fuzzy on like, like when we debated this before, I want to say that we wanted to do away with parking requirements for like residential properties or residential properties of a certain size. Um, so, so, I mean, the, the question is like, you know, like the, 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 the fix, what I'm fuzzy on is it's like, like what fix we want. So Gabe, it sounds like you like the, the waiver route as opposed to um, just doing away with the requirement for all or a portion of. I mean, I'd support doing away with all of it, but the, the fact is that we already have the, our professional planners recommending a waiver process. Um, and again, there probably are projects like out, uh, if we built massive housing out in the Elks club, <laughs> they, they probably have some parking for those people. I'm just saying, cause I think it is a little outside of a normal walk for a lot of people. Yeah. And I wasn't saying that we, we shouldn't propose it. We have in the past proposed other, other neighborhoods. Um, I think we had actually when residential 15 went through 1500, uh, the parking exemption went through, that was something the council had thrown in after we had, I think, tried to eliminate parking in riverfront. I think we had picked like riverfront, mixed use residential and residential 1500. And there were a bunch of, there's an outcry. And one of the counselors happened to live in a residential 1500 neighborhood and said he wanted to get that put in. And so the other two were nixed, but this one was left in. So we have tried in the past to add more neighborhoods. And, you know, I think I've said in the past, as, as you get farther out to get in and get into places where there aren't there isn't on street parking. I don't see any reason why we need to regulate parking. Um, so, uh, I think Maria mentioned river street, no on street parking in river street. I don't know why we need to regulate it at all. Um, the, the market will regulate how, how much parking to build and how much building to build, depending on what that per particular, you know, use is trying to do. And they'll, they will maximize their, their use of that land because they can't, externalize those um, burdens onto the neighborhood. Um, other places that have on-street parking, you've got a little bit more of a discussion. Some neighborhoods, there's on-street parking, but it's not an issue. There's plenty of on-street parking. And others like Berry Street, it's a significant, it's a, it's a pretty tight parking. So adding uh, you know a bunch more housing 
you know, um, and having all that housing drop that additional parking into the on street just makes it that much harder for those folks who are already trying to park on street. I mean, you just think about where some of the Boston neighborhoods and fights go on for on street parking. Um, and, and it's just a policy that's not necessarily good or bad. It can be, well, let, let everybody fight it out and let the market sort it, sort it out. But those people talk to counselors, everyone who's got a car and is in a bad spot on Barry street is going to talk to their counselor. And that's how it gets back around to kind of killing some of the proposals. Okay. So sounds like our plan is when we take up the other zoning changes, we'll take up uh, Mike's waiver suggestion. Is suggestion the right word, Mike? You'll be suggesting a waiver. Um, okay. Sounds good. Um, thanks for bringing it up, Gabe. I think there's a lot of supporters of easing up the parking here. So it's good. Uh, do we want to do anything else with the CNU stuff? I had a People question about that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Is somebody else? No, go. go. Um, oh. We were, uh, Ariane and Mike were talking before about the four unit, uh, or allowing four units per site. And under what we are proposing, is that four units despite the density limit for that? lot is that the idea yeah okay okay i just wanted to make sure that that was what we were talking about yeah and i think the way that we could talk about this is it's just um i think because I'm, I'm trying to go over my brain like convincing ways to talk about this because it's inevitable we'll also talk at city council and i don't want to screw that up um if you couch it as like the biggest problem to housing in the state from from what I've learned and what I've seen is uh, people who are over housed and Montpelier certainly has that problem of large house with one or two people in it. And, you know, that that I think contributes so much more to the housing problem than out of staters or the secondary rental market or these other things that get blamed. Um, just from like the data stuff I've seen, some of this is just from the work that's been done at the tax department where I work, where what I've seen. Um, so we couch it as like, that's a problem for us. That's a problem. Like what we're proposing in our response to CNU gets directly at that specific problem where we're not having our regulations require people to be over housed anymore. So within the design review district, we are saying there's no density requirements. You can have a lot of units in a big house and it's not gonna be something that's going to stop your application. All the aesthetic regulations that we're doing, we're gonna keep doing. And so you, you know, but but as far as the units and the how, how many people can be in a building, uh, we're not gonna do that. And then outside of it, we're gonna, it's the same problem we're getting at. If there's a big Victorian that's outside of design review district and someone wants to turn it into four units, which I actually, I'm a renter living in one of those right now, by the way, four, four units in a big house in the meadows. Um, then if you're outside of design, design review, then that's just something we're going to allow in the, in the city. And um, so it gets at that, both of our suggestions get at that same problem, which we're trying to identify as the biggest problem. Um, and I think if you couch it that way, it's, I believe it's hard to, to say no. Um, does that answer kind of, what you're thinking? Yeah, I sort of make we, sure the density rules wouldn't still <clears throat> guide it. But yeah, yeah. I, I modified the uh, document I was keeping to specify that to because um, Mike had at, Mike said he was a bit fuzzy on that, um, but I, I I modified the notes to say without regard for density because that was kind of the point. It's st we're still requiring it to be on a conforming lot, which I can see as being a, maybe you're non-conforming for some weird thing and then we're going to say you can't have four units now which when there's not going to possibly be a connection but i get why we would want to make sure it's conforming already because then it could prevent some worst case scenarios too 
uh, um, I don't know. Does anybody have thoughts about that? I didn't even really mean to bring it up, but okay. Do we have any more things to talk about with the CNU stuff, or do we feel like we we have a plan for that? Yeah, John, you're good with where we're at with that. Ariane. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so um, I haven't, I haven't modified the notes anymore. We're just going to keep those there. Um, and then we'll use that to work off of when we go to do their proposal formally later. Uh, so I'm going to move on on the agenda. And the next thing was to review outline of zoning changes for new amendment. And that's a Mike thing. So Tell us what that's about, Mike. All right. Let's see what we've got. All right. So at this point, we're not going to go through all these. I was just going to kind of um, roll through them just to give an idea of what types of things we're looking at. Um, so as we work through applications, we always highlight things that come in as um, either things we had questions on or things where we know are mistakes. And so we've just started to put together, um, you know, like uh, we don't have a definition for top of bank. We've got a couple of riparian setbacks are measured from the top of bank, but we don't have a definition. So we need to add that in and um a couple of references that are wrong. We have a, a zoning district boundary that needs to be fixed because of a boundary line adjustment. So this is what a lot of what we're doing at this point, and then we'll rearrange them. So they're in numerical order. And some of these are just questions. Should we, you know, perhaps exempt unroofed structures such as car chargers? I think that comes in. Uh, somebody wants to put in a car charger. And it doesn't, you know, it's not a structure, but does that need a permit? Um, you know, probably not, but we do kind of need to have something in the zoning that would give us the permission that says, no, that does not need a permit. So there are a couple of these types of questions that have come up from time to time that we'll go through. Um, uh, this was one we talked about last time. So the figure 215, that's the, that is the use chart. So maybe we should split multifamily into two groups. It's currently five or more as multifamily, but maybe we should have one as multifamily five to 14 and another one that's multifamily 15 or more. And then the smaller one could be a permitted use for most or all districts while the large one can, can keep the same designations. So that goes to the fact that um, Conditional use looks at only three things, you know, municipal services, character of the area and traffic. And so we already know municipal facilities is not right, is not an issue. Um, the state is trying to get communities to stop using character of the area for some of these smaller multifamily. So if we did that, that would get more of them to be permitted uses and not conditional uses. And then the third is traffic and traffic only applies to 75 or more new trips. Well, that's about 15 units creates 75 trips. So we're like, well, why wouldn't, why would we put, you know, an eight unit multifamily through conditional use, all that extra time, all that extra money, all the extra stuff we could split it up. So that's just, it's a proposal. And these are all things we'll go through each one of these. When we've got this all pulled together, we'll go through each one of these individually and make a decision as to whether or not uh, we'll keep it on the list that will eventually get warrant for public hearing. And then we can add in whatever else you guys have. And so you'll see the list, uh, some stuff, um, you know, it's, it's a fairly decent sized list at this point. Most of these are, you know, typos, mis, uh, mislabels. A couple of them are more significant. Um, you know, this is one that's up here to talk about street typologies. It's a requirement, doesn't really appear in our zoning. Maybe we should clear up the rules to talk about the street typologies. Um, so that is, 
that's the list right now. I will, I can send this out to everybody where it is, um, where it is now. These are just ideas, but I did want to go and say, this is kind of how we build them. Um, for folks who haven't done these zoning amendments in the past, what usually happens at this point is we've got A, we've got B, C is going to be some recommendations or public comments, and we just build these things out. So we'll get public comments on these things and then we'll make decisions on them. Um, you know, and we may get public comments that support them or don't support them. Um, and then eventually planning commission supports this change or planning commission amends this change or whatever. So that's how it usually works. We'll just keep building out these Excel tables um, and then eventually make a strikeout copy. Like I said, I didn't want to go into too much detail because it is just a long list and I could drone on for hours on why each one's important. But really at this point, it's just to go and show you we have started to pull these things together. We'll get more information. Um, ultimately, we're not going to warn any hearings until we get that information from Country Club Road. Um, part of this is to kind of be all prepared. So when Country Club Road says, we need to rezone this, this part will be rezoned to mixed use residential or riverfront or whatever. And this part of it will be rezoned to res 6,000 or res 9,000 or res 3,000, whatever it is the new zoning designations that would fit, that would be needed to be made in order to make that rezoning possible. And then we can just go through and add those on, but we're, we would be all ready to go because we've already done all these reviews of these typos and um, small changes like the one we discussed earlier. Does, does, does it make sense? I assume everyone would be like, yeah, that just makes sense that we would allow waivers for parking um, if you're providing or near transit or providing these other um, bicycle amenities. Um, so those are the types of recommendations we have. And if anybody knows of any others or wants to explore others, we can certainly go through and have more conversations. So, so Mike, you, you think, so we're going to wait to do zoning changes until the country club changes are known. So what's the, what's the timeline? We, I think we can start going through them. Um, I will have, you know, we're still working on the city plan. Um, I'm working closely with the SE group. We are still going to have a couple of chapters that we all need to work on to put together. Um, I, I don't think you guys have looked at community services. So we still have that chapter to do and we still have land use to do. But we also um, can start having meetings to discuss. I can flesh out what was in that Excel table and get that out to you. And we can start having conversations about those. Um, as you know, we only meet twice a month. Uh, if once in April and once in May, we meet to talk about those, you know, by June, we're starting to talk about what country club road, you know, the decisions for country club road should be coming in in June to know what the master plan is going to say. And we'll want to start making those changes. So I don't, I don't think it's too far off to start discussing what's on, on these Excel tables and to really start getting ready for, for June, which, although that seems far away, doesn't take long when you're only meeting twice a month. Yeah, no, that's soon. Uh, that's great. That's great. Uh, uh, so, so will it be June that we have the meetings on all of the zoning changes? Um, I think we'll be having a conversation about what the country club proposal would be or what the ideas would be for the public hearing. I would bet our zoning, the planning commission zoning public hearing would be either July or August. Okay. So this zoning, I just, I'm just trying to understand like what, what you're thinking of conceptually that public hearing would involve all of the zoning changes we've been talking about or just the country club ones? All of them. Okay. We'll have meetings to talk about these. Um, but the official warnings that go out in the notices that go out, we start promoting and trying to get a lot of public input on. 
we could have a public meeting before, have a public hearing before and just talk about things generally to go through and say, hey, these are the ideas we're thinking of. Do you want to, you know, have more of that? But um, it, unless we've got something coming up that's uh, very specific that we want to get input on, I think we would put together most of what we want to do. We would then have a meeting among the planning commission to talk about here's where the city council came down with their decision on country club road. Here's the staff's recommendation for zoning. Do you guys want to have a conversation on that? What do you guys think? You know, do you think we should zone it for more density, even though it, you know, they could build it with res 6,000, but should we make it res 3000? So it's got more infill potential. Um, that type of conversation. Okay, that sounds good. Is everyone is everyone okay with that plan to basically have our zoning? Um, the goal would be to have our our zoning hearings all over all the stuff in June. Yeah, I, I'm good with it. I I don't know as much as of input as there is into the Country Club Road project that. I would feel like I wanted to monkey around with whatever came out of that process myself. But in terms of all the zoning changes, yeah, I think we could, it's probably going to take a few weeks based on what we did last time. Yeah. It can be, I mean, how we get there, what they, they'll decide how many units. I mean, I think the max housing proposal that is, is in the conversation is 500 units on country club road. Um, and how would we break that into different zoning districts. They're, they're not discussing how to break it into zoning districts. That would be a piece that would kind of come down to, to you guys and to staff making a recommendation. And there may be various ways of doing it. Um, John, I think is the only one here. We had long conversations on how to zone Saban's pasture. Um, how do we, you know, we knew what the potential was, but do we want to zone it this way and that would encourage this, or do we want to zone it that way and that would encourage that? And eventually the planning commission recommended zoning all of Sabin's pasture, all 100 acres at res six, 6,000. So that's seven units an acre, roughly. Um, and then the city council threw that out and said, nope, we don't want that. We want high density at the bottom and we'll make that riverfront at you know one unit per 1500 and the rest of it's going to be rural so they changed it they did something different so we're, we're probably going to have a number of options to consider how would we like to zone this we might be able to do a little bit of this we might be able to do a little bit of this and then we'll have to have a discussion of you know what the recommendation is we'll go to public hearing and hear from the public and the public may disagree with where staff is or may disagree with where you guys are and we make a decision and send it to council. It's so it's not always black and white based on, oh, we know this is the development, so we know this is the zoning. Um, there's usually some some amount of gray that goes into it. One thing that could be a factor, Mike, just to think about as in the summer people have vacations, we start to maybe have quorum issues some weeks. Um if I remember, I don't know. I think August gets really blown up for us. So, yep. And it may it may be one that we try to have some meetings and some hearings, and it may get pushed. I it more than once, you know. And I think you've you've been here, Kirby, for a bunch of these zoning updates. We pushed the hearing until September. Um, yeah. In this case, it's because it's too it's too hard to get hearings and and hear from people, or we'll we'll have it in yeah. August it goes to city council and gets blown up because everybody comes back from vacation and is mad. I'm, I'm a little concerned about delaying things too much because we don't want, we don't want the city plan getting like delayed. We don't, you know, um, so just, just since we're on the topic, do people know, like, is anybody, is anybody going to be unavailable in for a big chunk of June that they're aware of now? How about July? It's possible that I won't be around the first week of July, which just shouldn't be a meeting week anyway. Um, 
but then August is also is going to be some unavailability for me. I, I'm out in August. The I'd have to look at the dates, but probably when we'd have a meeting. Same here. For August, John? Yep. Yeah, that happens pretty much annually. We August gets just gone. Um, we'll, we'll sort them out and cancel meetings as, as appropriate. And like we I said, we'll always... fit stuff in for, from a zoning standpoint yeah. for, for Country Club Road. Like we said, Country Club Road is looking to build in 2024. So as long yeah. as we're done you know, by, by Christmas, we'll be fine. I wouldn't want to be having zoning hearings at city council during budget, which starts in December. So I would, whatever we do, as long as it gets to city council for October, I would be, I'd be happy. If, if, if for some reason the, the, the deliberative process with the country club project gets way delayed, um, would you be okay, Mike, if we just did the other zoning before that, just to get it out of the way? Yeah, okay. we can do that. I was just trying because because it takes it's such a, a heavy lift. I, I get it. Yeah, to, to do the zoning updates, we usually try to lump as many of them together as we can. And we're expect we're also expecting hearing. Well, we're, well, we're actually hoping for hearings in what the next couple of months for the city plan, right? Yep. So so then there'll be that whole process in parallel. Um, okay. We can always have some hearings on non Mondays, like if we're going to have an unavailability. I mean, it's an exciting time for the Montpelier Planning Commission. We've got major zoning changes, major city plan overhaul, but it might mean scheduling some hearings on some non Planning Commission nights. Um, I think that that could be an option too to get more stuff done. Okay. Don't lose, don't lose hope. What we do is very important and your time is well spent. Um, okay. What do we, do you want to, did you want to have anything, did you want to have anything else or did you have anything else to say? Sorry, uh, Mike, about the zoning changes? Nope. I just wanted to let you know, we were, we were starting them up. I might organize them and get, you might get an email on them, but don't feel pressured that there's any big timing issue on it. It's just, if I've got them and people want to start looking through them, um, then you'd have, have what we have so far. Okay. That, I mean, from what I saw of that preview you just gave us, like that seems like all, it seemed almost all technical housekeeping. And then I don't know, I didn't see a single issue that there'll be, there'll be two or three policy ones that are in there that are kind of general. Okay. So, so yeah. So, whenever, so whenever even though we're going to send the CNU stuff under like separate cover with the policy reasons why, shouldn't we also have the, the technical language that would go into the zoning? Right, Mike, shouldn't you you guys write that? Yeah, that would eventually end up on, on that list I just showed, that Excel yeah. table. We yeah. would have one that would say, you know, usually what I end up with is is the number the, the next cell would have the very specific change of what is being proposed. And then the next cell is kind of an explanation of what it is. And some of them might go, go and say C, CNU AARP recommendation memo from PC. Um, and it might refer back to that specific discussion that we, we just had previously. Okay, that sounds good. Um, maybe as far as for next time, um, will we have some more chapters? I I think I was trying to remember on my notes because I mentioned community services might be all we have left. Seventh. Uh, so the twenty seventh is so that's March twenty seventh. Yes, or April 10th. So when I talked with them, I think they're expecting to have a bigger rollout on April 10th. So that's one month. They're going to 
show you a whole bunch of new ones, but we did want to go and have a, on the agenda to have a conversation on the 27th of some templates um, of a couple of them that are done just so you guys can get a chance to sit down and say, yeah, this is, this is, you know, exactly where we were hoping this was going to go now that they've put a bunch of work into it, but they've got like six or eight of them going right now. And we're working on working through them, but we just want to make sure we get one last time where we bring you guys a template to go through and say, here's the template. We've made all the changes made all the final stuff. What do you guys think of, because everything is going to look like this one. And then, and okay. saying that they've already have like six or seven of them that are, that are mostly built out. Okay. Well, that's, that's, yeah, it sounds like they have been busy. So, so you're saying that our next meeting, uh, SE is going to check in with us. Yep. SE will check in on the 27th and then they'll, they'll be know. most of the that's agenda fine. on the 20th or the, excuse me, the 10th, April 10th. Oh, oh, there'll be most of it on the 10th. And then we'll be kind of done with as far as our suggestions for SE group. Um, yep. And then we still I, have I, a conversation I, on community services and land use. Right. I think we should do community services or land use next time on the 27th, in addition to SE group checking in. I know, I know you're buried by the country club, which I get it. Um, um, yeah, I think it's just for purposes of just trying to, to move it along the city plan along. Yep. I'll see if I've got three quarters of community services done. Um, there were just a couple of chapters that a couple of sections because community services is seven different things. I've already done recreation. I've already done parks. I've already done senior center. I've already done cemeteries. Uh, I think what's left is the homelessness, um, the conflict assistance, which is out of the CJC, and there's one more, but there's 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 smaller pieces. Oh, uh, child care. So those okay. are the three. Those are the three pieces that are left. Um, so if I can finish those, then we've got those. Those are the implementation strategy. I haven't written chapters, so. Obviously, as many of you know, there's two both pieces. Uh, well, if you um, for one thing, if you don't get all of the pieces, that's okay. We could do the bulk of it, um, and then um, if you can get like just a like sketch of a chapter, if you can get that posted in the next week or so, I'll try to go over it also, and then at least we can have. Um, I'll try to help you and make sure that that's ready to go. Um, but if we can, if we can do that, we'll be in good shape. And then, so when we get done with SE group in early April, late April meeting can hopefully be land use plan. And, and that's what, uh, planning commissioners, you should be thinking about the land use plan. Maybe, you know, the land use plan is bringing the whole thing together, the whole plan together. So if, if folks could get, um, acquainted in the next couple of months with, all of the chapters that we have, especially the big ones, um, you know, we're going to be tasked with, unlike most times, you know, we've got suggestions coming from somewhere else. We got to come up with from scratch, the land use plan chapter, but I'm sure Mike's going to help us a ton, but, um, but we're not going to have some other committee bringing it to us. Like we normally get, you know, um, that's a big advantage that we normally have, that we won't have, uh, but the overarching big land use plan ideas we're going to need to develop out. And so people can start thinking about that and bring those ideas. Um, I think, I mean, we, the things we tend to always say are probably going to be the things like walkable community, et cetera. But, um, but yeah, start thinking about that for late April. We had the solar shading issue too, which is, which is going to be part of the zoning stuff. So we'll probably, whenever we have a meeting coming up that we do have some empty space on, we'll revisit the solar shading. Because yeah, if we want to add that to the zoning amendment, then we'll have to have that conversation of if it's going to get added on again or not. Yeah, yeah. And I'm assuming it, it will be. Um, 
John put in a ton of work like on that, that we need to, 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 to revisit. And I don't think the city count. It didn't like, I sent it to the city council when he did it last time, but it was like, they, I don't know. It was after they had already received it. I don't, I don't know how much attention was paid to it. Um, anyway, solar shading issue, uh, it's another zoning thing. So we actually kind of, so we have like four categories of zoning things. Uh, Okay, so it sounds like we have a plan. Um, does anybody, does everybody feel good? Did they follow that conversation about what to expect over the next couple months? Um, if we don't have any any questions, then we can move on to reviewing the minutes and adjourning. Um, go ahead, Mar Maria. I was just wondering if there might be a chance to meet in person in the next two or three months. <laughs> It'd be nice to actually meet everybody. Um, and I'm not sure if the commission's always been remote, but it would be nice just to have like, before we move into like public hearings, just to kind of meet fellow commissioners. Um, that's a good idea. What do other people think? I think oh. it's a good idea. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Mike looks lonely. He needs <laughs> he needs more people there. Do we want to try to target a week right now? March 27th. April 10th. April 10th April might be a tricky one because we all will want to have our computers up because SE Group is going to be going through their all the web websites and all the changes. And so if you're here, you'd be looking at the screen, um, which isn't the end of the world, but it's certainly probably a lot easier to be looking at your computer screen that night. But any of the other nights I think would work. It's a good point. I've gotten used to doing a bunch of stuff on my computer during the meeting, which I didn't use to bring a computer to meetings. So I'll be less productive when I'm there in person, but that's okay. I'll figure something out. Uh, do you guys want to say next time then, the 27th? Yeah, let's um, do it. I see groups sure. going to check in with us. And what was the other thing we said we're going to do? We're going to um, hopefully look at the uh, the facilities. Yep. Yep. It'll either be or community, the, or services, community services. Or... I mean, yep. Community services. Yeah. yeah. All right. Optional, obviously, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna try to see people in the flesh next time. All we're this social through. pressure, all of a sudden, you know. <laughs> gonna drag Aaron yeah. out. No, no, or, I'm happy to come. I'll, I'll be there. I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it's totally optional, but only losers will be remote, just so you know. So, you know, no pressure. Uh, okay, so let's let's take a look at the minutes. Um, Mike sent a separate email, by the way. The first the first one, something went wrong, and it wasn't the I right grabbed, document. Just grab the wrong things. So look at Mike's newest email to review the minutes, and I'll take a motion to approve when people are ready. I would note for December 12th that it's Peter Kelman with a K. Okay. That's a note to change. It's a bit of an aside, but I strongly approve the use of the verbiage beef up standards in the January 9th minutes. <laughs> Not a legal term.
I think it's just professional. Can you unbeef them? <laughs> Lean, right? Streamline. That's it. That's a that's a DB thing. <laughs> so I move um, approval of the December twelfth, January 9th, <clears throat> January twenty third, and February thirteenth minutes with Mike's change on the December twelfth minutes. Okay, so we have a motion. Uh, do we have a second? I second. Second from Gabe. Does anyone need more time? Well, what is there still an agenda? Am I looking at the right? Is the 12th still an agenda or is that minutes? I'm sorry. Maybe I'm looking at the wrong. Is this at 526 PM that you sent us, Mike? Yeah. The December, the December one's an agenda, right? That's fine. Yeah. 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 Good call, Brian. Oh, did I still send another? Yeah, the yeah, December you're just keeping us honest, Mike. Yeah, we got two thirteen, one twenty three, and one nine minutes. Let me see what I've got here now. I wonder if somebody saved the agendas in the minutes box, and that's why I'm keep grabbing the wrong one. You said the December one. Yeah, December 12th. That. It's very annoying. I can open this one. All right, we've tried to send that to you again. I guess I could have probably just shared screen on it too. People Anybody want to receive it? I did not get it, Mike. No. Nope. All right. Well, let me. Yeah, just share the screen. We still have a motion in the set. A motion in a second. By the way. Um. I'll have to amend the motion if we find an issue here. This has become intriguing. Where am I? There I am. Share that. All right. You able to see that? So there was my Peter Hellman.
Actually, it looks like we'd have to also strike there were no members of the public in attendance, so we can strike that too because Peter obviously made comments. Um, Ariane, would you like to amend your motion? Yes, I, <laughs> I both didn't. Do I have to say to what? <laughs> I'm losing the thread here. Sorry. I I don't think it needs to be amended because it was based on my comments regarding these minutes anyway. So. Okay. I, I mean, yeah, her specific wording was to, to do whatever Mike said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're going to, so, so, so everyone, so everyone understands the motion is to strike the first to strike the sentence, there were no members of the public in attendance, and to correct Peter Kalman's name in the December 12 minutes. Um, so that's our motion. We had a second for Gabe. Those in favor of approving the minutes with those changes, say aye. 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 Okay. Opposed. Okay. Minutes done. Thank you. Uh, and do we have a motion to adjourn? Slightly early. Brian's thinking about it. I move to it. adjourn. Oh. OK, motion, motion from Marianne, second from John. We're adjourned. See you guys in two weeks in All person. Right. See you guys. Potentially. Bye.